Hi guys, welcome to Counterpoints. My name is Connor, and today I'm going to answer the question, is life worth living? Yes. Have a good one. <laughs> now, of course, that might not be a good enough answer for particularly anybody who's struggling with this question and arriving at a different conclusion, so let me walk you through it. I had difficulty scripting this because I'm in a lot better place mentally and spiritually than when the question was ripping me apart, so revisiting it is actually a little bit difficult to do. But I want to, specifically for people who are struggling, so if I even have a shot at giving you some helpful insight, I want to give it to you. I first realized I was going to die when I was around 8 years old. I knew about death, but I hadn't before felt that terror of non-existence until that moment. I was lying in a dark room by myself, and a few moments passed in which I was totally thoughtless and I didn't feel my heartbeat. I shot up realizing that one day that might be all that's available to me, thoughtless oblivion, and that terrified me. I'd been taught that when I died, if I followed an ancient code and dedicated myself to the worship of the creator of the universe and his perfect son, I would gain entry to a plane of perpetual bliss. But there were contradictions in that religion that made me skeptical of both the code and the promised outcome. If I doubted the religion, then I also had to doubt its promised outcome, and even if the religion were correct, there was no guarantee that my belief or my worldly acts would be deemed sufficient by the creator of the universe. Realizing that one day my experience not only may end, but was guaranteed to, was horrifying, and can still send me into a panic attack if I think about it too much. Despite this perhaps naive shock and horror, I was no stranger to death or the horrors that men can inflict on each other. While my parents were pacifists and raised me in a Christian household, I was mind-bogglingly raised to revere soldiers, and in particular the veterans of World War II. That's because while thou shalt not kill is a commandment handed down to us by God, it was clear that there was evil in the world, and to prevent that evil, sometimes men must travel into the pits of man-made hell to effect a greater justice. So while committing one of the most grievous of sins, the strongest of men could still serve great missions that redeemed and saved other men. My grandparents, an uncle, and a cousin all served in the military, and I felt similarly called by that strange and horrifying part of human psychology and history. When 9-11 happened, I knew I was joining the service because 1. I was still afraid of death. 2. A great moment in history happened in front of my eyes, similar to Pearl Harbor for my grandparents. 3. I couldn't think of a worse evil than indiscriminately killing civilians in the name of God, so if I could help bring those people to justice in a small way, then so be it. Four, I figured I could acquaint myself better with mortality and death by joining a death-dealing institution. I joined the Marines because they seemed particularly competent at killing, well acquainted with death, and capable of bringing me into greater communion with my mortality. There was a problem, though. I joined in a logistics position because for all my bluster of wanting to be in communion with death, the pacifistic teachings of my parents were rooted deep, and I feared for my soul if I took another human life, even if it was justified. I learned painfully that Marines do not deal with oblivion. They do not deal with the quiet terror or the potential spark of an afterlife. What they do and what they do well is indoctrinate their recruits to embody death and killing, to worship it, to view themselves as avatars of destruction and the manifestations of violence in the world. Just or unjust does not matter. The more you embrace the fitness regimen, the martial arts, firearms, and survival training, the more you worship the gods of death and killing, the more likely you are to survive or to die in a cause greater than yourself, and in that way, gain a form of immortality. You do this by connecting yourself to the human tradition of warriorhood, the Republic of the United States, and the institution of the Marine Corps. Marines, while being adept at killing and adept at training young men to be ready to die in combat, actually do very little to deal with the spiritual consequences of killing and dying. All you have to do is look at the thousands of American veterans broken by war and the haphazard services to support them to realize that 1. Human beings are not built spiritually for war, and 2. Our institutions most intimate with killing and death are actually wildly ignorant of the things they worship most. These truths left me in a spiritual tailspin after my service. I had accomplished a lot by the time I left. Having traveled the world, pursued hedonism with women and alcohol, trained with some of the best killers on the planet, and served one of the most dangerous institutions in human history. By all metrics I could look at, I had accomplished every short-term and intermediate goal, and when I looked at my future, I saw doom. My parents were getting older, my family was distant, my body was broken, and while I enjoyed alcohol and women, there was this desperate passion to my nihilist hedonism. Like, because I knew how fragile life was, because I knew how quickly life could be ripped away, I used women and booze as a way to try to desperately to have some kind of experience that would root me back into life rather than death. When I looked at the future, I saw decades of physical pain, losing people I love, the prospect of disease, the doldrums of civilian life, and a slow crawl into the grave. If there was no God, if there was no afterlife, if all that waited for me was mindless oblivion, then why suffer? 
Why watch my parents die? Why age? Why push through the pain? Why lose friends to death and distance? Why torture myself with the grind of education and work I couldn't care less about? If death would rob me of my mortal accomplishments, and if hedonism only brought me temporary respite, why go on? This wasn't a solitary revelation or even a fully articulated thought. It was a feeling, a weight around my neck, a gravitational pull trying to yank me into the underworld. And I listened to this siren song for months or maybe even years. One night, I found myself stoned in a bedroom in an empty house with a Kimber 1911 TLE-2 in my hand. I put a round in the chamber and closed my eyes. I looked into the back of my eyelids and searched desperately for any reason to stay on this plane of existence. I had an energetic pulse go through my gun hand, remembering the trained instinct I had used so much in the Marine Corps, and I knew that within a moment I could jack a 45 caliber round into my skull, have a flash of bloody pain, and then escape into the hereafter. Why stay? I stared into the dark and I saw two eventualities, seemingly as possible as the other. One was thoughtless oblivion, unending darkness, endless void to swallow me up for eternity. The other was a spark, a possibility, an afterlife on the tip of my tongue, an inexplicable hope of something better, fragile, improbable, but still there and as real as the void. A voice, maybe me, maybe my conscience, an angel or God himself said, what's the rush? And that thought stayed my hand. I stormed out of the room and into the night of the country estate. I pointed the pistol into the void and fired. A flash of orange lit up the night, and I saw the ball intended for my skull fly out into a forest. This close call with taking my own life was the death of a part of me in the beginning of something new. Up until that point, I had this insatiable need to know what was on the other side of the veil, to know if there was a god, an afterlife, death, or a sea of nothing. I had to know what it would be like. I had to solve the question of mortality. The question, what's the rush? gave me space to breathe. If all that was in front of me was suffering, then I would suffer. But while suffering, I would yank on the threads of spirituality, history, psychology, and philosophy, not to find some firm answer on life and death, but to pursue the inexplicable, confusing, and frankly terrifying nature of life itself. From this foundation, I started carving out space to become the man I thought I should be. All I did was put one foot in front of the other and endlessly think. What had really happened was I was traumatized, a small emotional cut at a time. Seeing the maimed and dead of World War II in microfiche film, losing a family pet, having a schoolmate commit suicide, seeing 9-11 on live television, getting jumped in high school, joining the Marine Corps, getting a loaded gun pointed in my face, losing a peer to a heart defect, a friend to suicide, and a loved one to old age. These situations all danced around the same problem, which is that I hated and feared death. But through these experiences, I learned. When I put a family member in the ground, I realized that her life and impact were real, and while she was just a nameless lost soul to history, she had been as real as the dirt I was putting over. I realized that as a mere human, I had no control over her endless sleep or transcendence to a higher plane. That was something for natural forces and God, if he exists, to decide. I didn't need to like this state of nature. I didn't need to embrace it. I just needed to accept it as real. By studying astronomy, I realized the heavens spun without my say-so, and they didn't care about my shrieks or mortal pleas, and that they dance to their own tune and will play the music of the spheres long after I take my last breath. Through studying science, I grappled with the miracle of life, that even according to our best science, the world was a raging cauldron, but within every storm, there were the seeds of life, and given enough time and energy, life emerges from the materials we view as dead. Not only that, but I was the product of a billion-year chain of existence, that microbes, fish, reptiles, mammals, and finally apes evolved, fought, and died by the billions in order to give me life. Any break in the chain, any misstep in my heritage, would have resulted in my non-existence. Not just that, but in their own ways, my ancestors, however distant, loved and were loved. They knew victory and defeat. They had great moments of peace and, and endured inarticulable suffering. They did it all with one motivation, the continuity, spreading, and ascension of life. Like a spark turned to flame and put to torch, it was handed generation to generation for millennia, resulting in me. Who the fuck was I to reject this gift? I barely have the right to question it. It is representative of the blood, sweat, and tears and suffering of a million generations, and they trusted me, through their gift of life, to continue that legacy. By studying philosophy and history, I very quickly learned that I was boringly and predictably amongst generations of angry young men grappling with eternal forces. The Egyptians, Greeks, and Romans had all struggled with life, purpose, and death, 
And not only had they found questions and answers I hadn't even thought of, but they were infuriated by them. I didn't find perfect heroes in history who had solidified their understanding of the world. I found an angry chorus of geniuses raging against the fickleness of the gods and bemoaning their own fates. The best they could do was find philosophical and spiritual rafts to cling to in the storm of existence. Hilariously of note, the men of certainty, vision, and filled with the zeal of gods never realized their visions completely and were cut down by disease, jealous rivals, or the consequences of their own success. By looking at my biological and historical heritage, I realized that I wasn't alone, a solitary candle waiting to be snuffed out by the wind, but that I was a part of a chorus, a human symphony, pushing always to live, love, and understand and be more. Not only that, but what I did, however small, would affect the future. If I hurt people, that affected the future. If I killed myself, it affected the future. If I had children, I affected the future. If I died nameless to history, I still affect the future. If I achieved my wildest dreams, I affected the future. If a meteor came crashing down onto the planet and eliminated all of my ancestors and I had done, that would also be okay. Our universe has sparked into existence from a formless void. Life has sprung from the storms of our planet from the dead earth. Whether now or a billion years from now, the great game of life will be played. So why not play it yourself while you have the time and ability to do so? Death can remain a mystery. It can remain terrifying and quiet. It can be the thoughtless void or the plane of bliss. All I and all you have is the time we have been given in this life and it is up to you on how you spend it. If you want to spend that time high out of your mind playing games with friends, good, do that. If you want to spend your time improving your community, helping the weak, doing what you can to improve the world, do it. If you want to chase and punish the evils of men, do it. If you want to pursue power either for your sake or for the betterment of the world, do it. If you want to love, create, and lead a family, do it. If you want to pursue the mysteries of God or the cosmos, do it. But the truth is, however horrible you look, however poor you are, however humble your beginnings, there's plenty in this world to do. There are joys to be had, suffering to alleviate, bad men that need killing, and good men who need your help. Death will come for you eventually, and to sit and wait for him to come claim you is a waste. To rush into his arms is a waste. To take the kaleidoscope of life's experiences and to reject it for oblivion when that fate is coming anyways is to reject the gift of life given to you by a million unknown and unnamed ancestors, living beings who fought, suffered, and died for you. To quote George R.R. R. Martin, death is so permanent whereas life is filled with possibility. Your life is worth living, so live it. If you like this video, like, share, and subscribe, dislike, all comment in the comment sections below, type in comment from the comment gods, join the Patreon, support us however you can, catch you in the next one.